The name of this lesson is called The Divine Promise, Part 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection or maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away or turn aside to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God all over again and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh often upon it and bringeth forth herbs suitable for them by whom it is prepared receiveth blessings from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is near to cursing, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, the things that accompany salvation, even though we speak this way. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints, and you do minister to them. Now the epistle to the Hebrew was written to the Hebrews to tell the Hebrews to stop being Hebrews and to become Christians, and to sever themselves from the Old Testament concept of law and covenant, and to adopt the, the new covenant, which was sanctified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many use this passage of scripture to try to prove that you can lose your salvation and that you could fall away to eternal judgment. So let's look at it. In verse four, it says, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away and turn aside to renew them again unto repentance. The people they are talking about have at one time repented, which means they had a change of mind and a change of heart. They received the word of God, as Jesus said in the parable of the sower. They received the word gladly. But when the pressure came and the difficulties came, the Lord Jesus said they had no root in themselves. And so they withered and perished. We know he is talking about repentance in verse 6. He said it is impossible to repent and not to really believe. It is possible to have a change of mind and not to walk in the light with God. It is possible to hear the good word of God, to see the powers of the world to come, such as the restoration of human beings and divine healings and the gifts of the spirit and the conquest of demons by the power of God and to taste of the heavenly gift. This passage teaches us that there are some that are really good at being counterfeiters in the world. They would fool anyone. This is very similar to the tares and the wheat fields. They can go along with the Holy Spirit. They can taste the heavenly gift. This word taste is a very interesting word, by the way. When Jesus was on the cross, they gave him vinegar mixed with gall, and he tasted it, but he would not take it in. So there are people that taste the blessings of God, 
that taste the power of God, that have experienced things we have experienced as believers, yet they have never made a total commitment to God. They have never said, whatever the cost, I will be your disciple. They have not denied themselves and taken up the cross and really followed after him. The key is following after him. That is the key. It's possible to deny yourself and to even endure suffering, yet never to have really walked with him. In John chapter 6, some of Jesus' disciples were followers, but they did not walk with him any longer, it says, which means they were content to follow him and to listen to his teachings and even say they were disciples. They partook of the food for the 5,000 and the 4,000, and they even talked about the coming of the kingdom. And yet when Jesus finally brought them to a place of total commitment and said, I am the bread of life and you must eat of me and drink all of my blood or you have no life in you. The world is filled with tears and these tears were sown by the enemy and they are all around us and we will never know all of them until the harvest time, but they are tears. So it is possible to be enlightened the word enlightened means to have knowledge of. And these tares say, that is right. It's true. I believe it's true. Amen, preacher. Preach it. Yet they do not follow. They have tasted the heavenly gift, but they have not taken it in. They were made partakers of the Holy Spirit, just like Judas was. Judas was sent out like the other disciples, and Judas used the name of Jesus and the power of God to heal the sick. The heal, he healed lepers and raised the dead and cast out demons. Yet the scriptures say that Judas was never really a believer. In fact, the Lord called him a devil. He was a devil who masqueraded as a Christian. You are hanging yourself with your own rope if you say, if you lose your salvation, that's it. It's impossible to restore them again unto repentance, which means that any person that has ever turned aside from their faith, and we all have, and we've all walked away from our faith, and we have all turned aside because of sin and left the light. We left the light and we plunged into darkness. So if you're going to teach that doctrine, you might want to be prepared for the word impossible. The impossible means exactly that, that if you walk away and turn aside, and if this passage is to be taken literal, then you are never going to come back. In fact, it is impossible for you to come back. Many of us have turned aside and have taken our own way at some time in our life, but now you are back. You're listening to the word of God and you're sharing the word of God with others, then obviously you are back. Yet the passage tells us there are some people that can be enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have gone along with the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the kingdom to come. There are people who have done this and they have repented and they have had a change of mind, but they do not persist in their faith. They do not persist in what they said they believed. Therefore, they are not renewed unto repentance. You must remember the context and the time that this book was written. Remember that the writer of this book, who was Apostle Paul, was greatly versed in the knowledge of the Old Testament. Paul was trying to set this in the context of the Old Testament scriptures so that we could understand the uh, message he was trying to convey here. During this time in Jerusalem, there were Jews who made professions of repentance, who said they were disciples of Jesus, who went along with the kingdom of God message as long as there was no pressure. 
Then when the pressure came, the priest in the temple, this is history, he would slit the throat of a pig and they would let that blood of the pig flow into the gutter outside the temple into the street. And they would have the people who were professing Christians who recanted on being a Christian spit in the blood of the pig and they would say it had no more power to save as the cursed Messiah Jesus. So that's in history. So when you read this verse, you must take this into consideration as well because these people were such good counterfeits that they fooled everyone for a while. But when it was time to show that they had undergone regeneration or being born again, they just didn't. They couldn't show that. If this is the teaching that you can lose your salvation, then it is also teaching that you cannot get it back. And this is not consistent in the teaching of the word of God. The key to this is found in verse 7. It reads, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh often upon it and produces herbs that it is suitable for them that planted it receiveth blessing from God. So there is one kind of ground, only one kind of ground that is described here. It is good ground. How do you know it is good ground versus bad ground? If you're just looking out at the field, you have two fields side by side. How do you know which field will be productive and which field will be unproductive of what you're sowing? There's only one way to know, and that is you have to wait to see what will happen to what is planted in each field. It says the earth that receives the rain and produces the fruit is the good ground. But the earth that produces thorns and briars is rejected by the farmers and is near to cursing and being unproductive. And the end is that it needs to be burned. If it comes up thorns and briars in the bad field, then you burn it. The ground lays fallow for a good while, then it regenerates, then it begins to produce fruit. The Holy Spirit is telling us to examine what kind of fruit do we have in our life and take a good look at it because that is going to tell you what kind of ground you are. If you produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life, which is love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and goodness and self-control and faith, then you are good ground. And if you don't produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life, which is the first thing that is produced when a person is regenerated, like when I was regenerated many years ago, I had peace and I had love. And I, became a, and I became very gentle to people around me. Before I was born again, I was quite a stinker. I was a fighter. And there was no one that would ever come and pick a, a fight with me unless they wanted to face the hard consequence of having maybe a fist sandwich for lunch. But right after I was born again, the fruit of love and gentleness came up. And people around me even noticed a huge change in my character. And I became a peacemaker and have ever since. So the good seed landed on good ground and brought forth immediately good fruit and not thorns and briars. But if you are still bringing forth thorns and briars, then you might be a tear in the wheat field. And in the end, the angels will separate the redeemed from the lost. Verse 9 is a very simple statement. It says, But beloved, speaking to the Christians, we are persuaded better things of you, and your end is not to be burned because you don't produce the thorns and the briars. We expect of you the things that go along with salvation and regeneration. So what is the proof that the saints persevere in the service of God? Well, it's the fact that they persevere. What is the proof that the land is good ground? 
Well, it produces a crop, a good crop. And what is the proof that the land is deceptive and is not the good ground, but bad ground? If there is no love, no joy, no peace, no patience, goodness, no self-control, and if there is no faith, then there is no reason to believe that the ground is good. In verse 10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints, and you do minister. What is God not going to forget? He's not going to forget those who act by grace through faith to minister to the needs of the body of Christ and to proclaim his gospel. What does it prove then if you are remembered by God? Well, it proves that you are good ground because only the good ground produces good fruit. Now, those who have tasted the good word of God and have tasted of the power of God, if they turn aside, and really Judas is a good example of one who turned aside, yet Judas was the perfect counterfeit, for he never really believed. He betrayed what he said he believed and turned aside to eternal judgment. So there are people in whom God deals with There are those that God is working with to produce good fruit, regenerates the ground. He gives them the word of God and he shows them the power of the age to come and he reveals himself to them and even granted them repentance so they can say, I am so sorry, Lord. And they turn around and they start walking in the right direction again. But there are people that turn away from God and persistently walk away from him. And when you walk away from light, you can only go into darkness. So no matter how you justify yourself, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that believeth in me shall not walk in in the darkness, but he shall have the light of life. So if we are really believers we will be walking in the light. If we really are believers, we will be producing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. If we really believe, then we will be the good ground spoken of in Hebrews chapter 6. The good ground does not become bad ground. The good ground endures and produces good fruit. The bad ground produces tares and thorns and briars. What goes with salvation is to have a hunger for his word and a thirst for his righteousness and to know that you have passed out of darkness into his marvelous light because you love the brethren. Even though your love may not be perfect, Now, if this scripture in Hebrew is really teaching that you can lose your salvation, then you need to check the Greek word impossible in verse four. This is the same word used a little further on in verse 18. And it reads that by two unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. This is the same word. If you are going to take this verse in Hebrews literally, then you are never going to come back because it is impossible. That makes a lot of sense if you really think about it. Now, John six thirty seven, all that the Father giveth me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast them out. So here is our security, and here is our hope of glory. The constant love of our loving God who is the savior of all mankind, especially those that believe. So salvation is a gift. It comes by grace and it is appropriated by faith and it is productive of good works. John 6, 44, no man comes to the father except the father draws him. Jesus said, all that the father gives me will come to me. 
All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will not ever cast them out. Never. Verse 39. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose no one, none, but should raise it up again at the last day. So your security comes from knowing that this is my Father's will. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And in verse 65, and he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. So this fits perfectly with John chapter 10. Not only is Jesus the bread of life, but also the good shepherd. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. And neither shall anyone, including Satan, can snatch them from out of my hand. And my Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to pluck them from my Father's hand. I and my Father are one, and we are one in agreement. So our salvation does not depend on emotion. It does not depend on uh, theology. Our salvation rests upon a decree of the Father based on the redemption of his Son. Jesus said that when I am lifted up, I shall draw all mankind unto myself. It is the will of the Father that all mankind have an opportunity to respond to his grace. In Titus 2.11 it reads, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. This is not how the Greek text really reads. The Greek text reads this. For the grace of God which brings salvation to all mankind has appeared. And in the Greek, the intent is that the grace of God for salvation has appeared to all men everywhere with the intent that all men respond. It is that when given the opportunity, as Jesus said, some will not believe. Even if the dead are raised before their very eyes, they still will not believe. No matter what, they just will not believe. And God will not force them or compel them. The grace of God has appeared for the salvation of all mankind. This is what Apostle Paul said. That is the intent of God's redemption. His intent is to redeem all mankind, though he knows who will and who will not respond. Still, the intent of the gift was to bring us to, to life in Jesus Christ. 1 John 2, verse 2, And he is the propitiation or satisfaction, same word, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ was manifested to pay the price for the sins of the whole world. The whole world is not saved because the whole world will not accept the sacrifice of Christ. If God put a million dollars in, a, in deposit in a bank in your name, and if you never write a check on it, then whose fault is it? Is it yours or God's? God deposited the gift of eternal life by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. He did that for you and he did it for me and also for the sins of the whole world. It's not that man cannot cash the check, but they just won't. They will not believe they choose to walk in darkness and to follow the ways of sin. They love darkness rather than the light. This is why the wages of sin is death. 
Before payday, we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. This is the good news of the gospel. In John chapter six, salvation rests upon the decree of God. All that the Father gives to me will come and whoever comes, I will not ever cast out. You can't come unless my Father draws you and whoever my Father gives to me, I will lose not one of them. Not hard to understand this. If you are in Christ, you are secure. And you can get out of Christ the day that Christ gets out of God. The Lord says, this is my Father's will. There is no scripture that says, this is my Father's will, that if you sin and backslide, you will be lost forever. There's no scripture like that. Yet it says, this is my Father's will, that I will lose not one. Our security of salvation rests upon what Christ did and what he promised that has nothing to do with how we feel. Eternal salvation is not something that you earn. Then you have those who want to put themselves above another saved brother or sister by saying, well, these believers may be saved, but they will not be made one with Christ. They will not be joined in a spiritual marriage with him. There are those who feel that they are the select few that will be made one with Christ. What makes them a greater believer than another? If all are bringing forth good fruit and all are good ground, if a person understood a, a, the doctrine of adoption the way it was understood back in the Roman times, they would understand that as adopted sons and daughters in the family of God, the royal family of God, we all receive an equal inheritance. Adoption included receiving all that the father owns and all that the son possesses. This is why we are called joint heirs with Christ. We all receive the same inheritance as Christ receives. There is not anything else to receive if you have it all. This reminds me of like Matthew chapter 20. There were those who felt they deserved more than another. I've been to many churches in my lifetime and it is amazing how some, if not most, think because they hear a deeper level of the word or because they are more conservative in the way they dress or because they don't do some of the things that the world does, like participate in sports, or maybe they eat a certain way or so on, that they deserve to be much closer to Christ than other believers and that their inheritance will be greater than all the rest. So reading in Matthew chapter 20, I'm going to read that. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, uh, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, the first hour group, they supposed that they should have received more, 
and they likewise received every man equal pay, same inheritance, every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, these last, these ones that were hired last, have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Did not you agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is and go thy way, and I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? They all were in the same service of the Lord, and they all received the same inheritance. Even the ones who worked much harder, thinking they would earn more because they put in more hours. Well, surprise, surprise, at the end of time, all of God's sheep will receive the same and equal inheritance, which is all that the Father owns and all that the Son possesses. That's not a bad deal. But if you are working and striving and thinking you are going to get a greater reward because you are part of a certain denomination or you are under a very charismatic preacher, then the word of God says you are wrong. I wanted to mention this mainly because even though some may agree with you concerning salvation by grace, there is still that will of man that wants to add something to the finished work of Christ in bringing, bringing us into completion or maturity. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his grace, he has saved us and will bring us all the way over the finish line because the work is of God, not of us. He even works the will and the do in us to perform his will. So you can't even take credit for that. Salvation to the uttermost is a gift from God. Now going back to our security in Christ in John chapter 10, it says, no one can snatch you out of the father's hand and no one can take you out of the hand of the Lord Jesus. Some may say, but you can walk out of God's hand by your own free will. Well, let's clear that one up by saying we did not walk into God's hand by our own free will because we were sold under sin. We were a slave of sin. You could not save yourself by your own free will. It was the grace of God that touched you and gave you the capacity and touched your will to accept Christ into your heart. It is God that worketh the will and the do in us to perform his will. Left to our own devices, we would have never come to the Lord. The Lord touched our will to make it possible for us to respond to God's love and mercy in the Lord Jesus. We cannot just walk out of the hand of the Father and the Son. Why? Because we are not our own. We have been bought with the price. Therefore, glorify the Lord in your bodies. God purchased us with the blood of his Son on a cross, and we are not our own anymore. Why don't you just join the army and say, well, I can just walk out of here because I have a free will to do so. We'll try it and see what happens. Or if you were put in prison trying to exercise your free will and, and walk out because you have a free will, I'm just going to walk out the door. Don't think so. Paul says in Ephesians 3 verse 1, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner, of Christ Jesus. So let's say a person says, I don't want to glorify God in my body. I want to pursue sin. Well, if you pursue sin, then you will find out what happens to God's property when it does not want to do what God wants it to do. 
The good shepherd has a long chastening rod, and he knows how to use it when his sheep start to stray. Remember Jonah? He tried exercising his free will long before we did. God told him to go to Nineveh, and Jonah said, No, I am going to Tarshish. And God said, Well, have a good trip. Jonah 1 3, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for the port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. But as the story goes on, he ended up turning back and going to Nineveh, where God told him to go because he was God's property. God never compelled Jonah to go to Nineveh against his will, but he did put Jonah in the belly of a well for three days, and after three days of sloshing around in the ocean's depth and swallowing salt water and being regurgitated around with all kinds of dead fish along with stomach acids eating away at him, hot, sticky, wet, sick, and smelly, then Jonah suddenly exercised his free will and he did what God wanted him to do. He just wanted out of that well's stomach, and he was willing to go anywhere the Lord instructed him to go. And Jonah ended up in Nineveh, where God told him to go in the first place. So God has a way of persuading us without ever overriding our will. You know, the sovereignty of God is a very tricky thing. On the outside of the door of heaven, it says, enter in at the straight gate. But when you get inside over the door, as you turn around, it says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and I have ordained you to bring forth fruit. So really, we all have a limited freedom, but it's God's universe and God is running the show, not us. If we belong to him, he is faithful, even though we are not. Sometimes we're not, but he's faithful to keep us and to bring us back into the sheepfold. So you have an opportunity to respond to God's grace. And if you don't, then you will be the one to pay the price for it because you were given the opportunity John chapter 6 talks about Jesus being the bread of life, but also the fruit of eating that bread. It talks about the benefit of eating it, the bread of life. The benefit of eating that bread of life is that you will live forever with the Lord. Jesus said, uh, well, in John six thirty five, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never be hungry, and he that believes on me shall never be thirsty. The water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water that springs up unto everlasting life. John 6.46, Not that any man has seen the Father except he which is of God. He has seen the Father, speaking of the Lord Jesus. So only the Lord and the Holy Spirit has really looked upon the face of the Father. In verse 47, it reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believes on me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. In verse 47, in the Greek, he is saying, Verily, verily, or I am truly telling you that he that believes in me possesses now everlasting life and shall never come to judgment. Then he ends it by saying in verse 48, I am the bread of life. Then he goes on to say, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and never die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven if any man eat of this bread, he shall live for all eternity. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. You know, the minute he said this, the Jews took it literally, and they argued among themselves. They were asking each other, 
How can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's cannibalism. That is forbidden under the law of Moses. Then Jesus said to them, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Now they're really getting upset. The Lord said, If they eat my flesh and drink my blood, I will raise him up at the last day. Notice how he brings in here flesh and blood. Or he said his flesh was bread and his blood was drink. Bread and drink. Again, eat and drink. So what does it mean to eat the Lord's flesh and to drink his blood? It means to come to Jesus and to believe in Jesus. And that is life. My flesh is food indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. The Jews are not understanding and even some of his disciples start to doubt when he said this. They said, this is a difficult saying. Who can hear it? Or rather, who can understand it? When Jesus perceived that his disciples were mur murmuring among themselves, he said, does this offend you? Then he said, if you're, you're shocked at this saying, then you would really be shocked even more so if you saw heaven open up and I were to ascend up into heaven. Then in verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth or makes alive. The flesh profits you nothing. The words that I speak unto you are not literal, but they are spirit and they are life. The Lord was saying, I am not talking about literal flesh and blood and eating my literal flesh and drinking my literal blood. He was saying that coming to me is to eat the bread of God and to believe in me is to drink the life of God and to eat and drink is to live for all eternity. I am the living bread. You know, one particular church turns this into a bloody sacrifice. They call this transubstantiation. It's a long word. But the wine does not really turn into the literal blood of Christ, and the bread does not really turn into the literal flesh of Christ. But the sacrifice is once for all, it says. In Hebrews chapter 8, uh, all the way through 10, he hath offered one sacrifice for sin forever. Then he sat down at the right hand of God in heaven. So the communion table really represents our participation in the life of God. It is saying we have come to Jesus and we have believed in him. So it's really more of a celebration of what Calvary means. And that is God reconciling us to himself by the death of his son. So Christ omnipresent it is there on the Lord's table at communion. So to eat the bread of heaven is to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and to believe in him as our Savior. The Lord said, This is the will of him who hath sent me, which is my Father, that all that he has given me I shall lose not one of them. I shall raise them up at the last day. So eating his flesh is coming to the Lord and drinking his blood is believing in him. Then he will dwell in me and I in him. We have been united by faith in him and it is his will that we will never be separated from him. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Once we believe and follow him, we have eternal life and we shall never perish. And we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise and God cannot lie. The Bible says, for it is impossible for God to lie. That is the hope of the believer. And this is where the joy of the believer comes from. But remember, there is a condition in the fact that my sheep hear my voice, and they follow. And if they stray, then he will bring them back into the sheepfold. Why? He repeated it over and over again, because he will lose not one, 
Not one. Some people say, well, I don't believe that because this person went this way and that way. Well, we talked about the good ground and the bad ground. We talked about the wheat and the tares. We talked about if you are good ground, you will bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. If you are bad ground, then you will bring forth thorns and briars. Remember, there are a lot of counterfeits out there that listen to the word of God and they look like they're following. They call themselves disciples, but in the test of time, they do not follow him and they go back into the world and they never come back. They do not want to believe and they do not follow him and they do not walk in the light. Not to say that we don't stumble and we don't fall and we dab a little bit into the darkness of this world, but if we are his sheep, we will hear his voice and we will ultimately follow him and he will get us across the finish line. 